Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Libraries in Response. This is session 89 in the series. And uh, this is a sub-thread that we've been doing, State of the States, or possibly State of the Provinces, as one of our guests today is uh, speaking for the Ontario province of Canada. Uh, similar scenario, and we'll be able to hear some of the differences between states and provinces, I suppose, as we go along. Uh, we're also uh, privileged to have the state librarian from Idaho, Stephanie Bailey White, on with us. And uh, so Stephanie and Stephen are going to give us uh, the reports on libraries in their state and special activities and their, their outlooks for their states. <clears throat> we found this an interesting way to do a scan on what's happening in the world of libraries because the state libraries are, are very special, the provincial libraries, if you'll allow me to just use state for the that category of area of libraries. So, uh, excuse me. Well, I am. Getting, getting a slide. We have uh, started out here looking at, I mean, library, let me go back one more. We are the UBIT Libraries Network. We're an open consortium of uh, tech innovating libraries anywhere using emerging technologies to do interesting things, explore new services, and play the kind of leadership role that we believe in libraries to be well suited to play in their communities and, and the world at large, as we all are faced with uh, a tsunami of, of techno information technology in particular, and it's how it's just changing society in, in ways that we don't really appreciate. And libraries are, we've always believed for the 15 or more years that we've been focused on libraries, that uh, they're ideal as community laboratories or, or or hubs or showcases for this kind of technology for the for the community to get its hands on stuff and talk about these things and and develop their own policies and and uh, uses for it. Our uh, host is the IFLA, the International Federation of Library Institutions and Associations, based in The Hague. Uh, our longtime partner advocating for public access, which libraries are the premier providers of around the world, with uh, Stephen Weiber at the helm there uh, running the show today. Our sponsor is the Institute for Museum and Library Services. We're so happy they are have come on to support this series this year. Uh, we began as libraries in response and responding to the health crisis of uh, of COVID-19 in March of 2020, and it's just carried on. We've had crisis after crisis since then. Uh, now a general term in use for the, over the past year is polycrisis. This is, the term as we look at it is not simply multiple simultaneous crises, but they're entangled or interactive in certain ways that accelerate the, the phenomena and the risk factor of all of this stuff happening at once. It's not happy news, but uh, it is apparently the reality. Uh, we've tracked the, the health crisis and then on to the social crisis after the murder of, of, of Floyd and then to the economic crisis and then the political crisis and the, the pervasive uh, climate crisis. And now we have AI on the scene disrupting everything as a new crisis. So this is, this is we're in just sort of a high mode, but people are so adaptive. Humans are so adaptive that, you know, what happened yesterday is what's going on today. And, you know, we're just dealing with it. And we just don't feel these changes that, that are happening to us at really lightning speed in a, in a kind of historical context. But here we are, state libraries, state library agencies, they're very special institutions. We've uh, we've spent a lot of time working with and focusing on state libraries because they do so much and they sit at a, a, a nexus point in the library world, at least in the U.S. And they serve as this repository of information in that state. They they 
demonstrate these values uh, uh, through data collection. This is very valuable to know what's happening. Is the, they connect to every library. It's it's incredible that there are you know, 50-something agencies in the U.S. that have a direct connection to all 17,000 library facilities. That is a really efficient communication channel. And they do collect uh, data. Uh, IMLS collects a, a lot of data that the state libraries gather from their libraries, so they really know what's happening. Uh, new business models for content, equity of access, they're kind of a state lab as well as a, a major uh, funding source. They support all the libraries, especially the public and school libraries, not so much academic libraries, but they're all in the same boat. And they, they do provide an important channel for federal funds for libraries. Uh, state libraries used to supply quite a bit more funding for local libraries. A lot of building funds were were uh, implemented that way. That seems to have declined over the past uh, 10 years or so, but uh, the the federal library, IMLS, uh, channels roughly 80% of its annual budget to the state libraries through the LSTA, uh, LSTA grants, which are then used for various um, support services, whether it's uh, funding pilot projects in a state or uh, in the case of Georgia, they they pay the undiscounted portion of E rate for all the libraries, which is, as you would know, it's you know seventy to ninety percent of the cost of uh, broadband for a facility, and the Georgia State Library pays the remainder. So that's it's a different approach. Some are very active as kind of the uh, the sort of the Library of Congress for their individual states. Others play a different. The, the the standard saying is that if you if you've met one state library you've met one state library that they're not the same they're as varied as the states themselves but they they play a common role in supporting uh, public libraries in every state so let's get to it we've got uh, Stephanie on first from Idaho uh, and we're happy to have you back Stephanie so I'm going to stop sharing here and welcome you and turn it over to you if you're ready to go. Thanks, Don. I really appreciate that. And uh, looking forward to just catching up with folks, uh, sharing a little bit about what we're doing here in Idaho and uh, and seeing if I can get this going. Sorry, I've been having some challenges this morning <clears throat> and hoping that this is going to uh, work for me. So let's see if I can. And this might just show up in... Uh, in work mode and I apologize for that, but that is kind of where we're at this morning. So can folks see at least part of my PowerPoint there? Not yet, Stephanie. Not yet. Little green button at the bottom. Little green button at the bottom. Up the zoom. Just roll your cursor over the bottom. It'll pop up. Oh darn it. <clears throat> now I've done that. Let's see. Uh, well, shoot. The screen share button is not coming up when you. No, I've X, of I X'd window. out of. Let's see if I can. Uh, screen share should be there. All right. I'm no there. What you got going? There you go. All right. Okay. Perfect. Thank, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, I appreciate Don kind of uh, teeing us up to talk about kind of the different roles that different states have. Our mission is to assist libraries to build the capacity to uh, best serve their communities. And we've been around since 1901. I'm the 20th uh, state librarian in, in the state and have been here at the commission for 32 years. So I love what I do. I haven't been in the state librarian role for that long, uh, just the last three or four. And it's been an interesting three or four uh, to be sure. We've been focused really since uh, COVID on how we can help libraries keep students learning, keep adults earning, and improving the health and well-being of Idahoans. 
Uh, we serve about 850 public school, academic, and tribal libraries throughout the state, and we have 103 uh, public library jurisdictions, so a combination of city libraries, district libraries, and uh, three school community libraries. I know when, when Michael was going to be co-presenting, he has you know over 400 public libraries in, in his state, so uh, Don, you were spot on with, you know, when you see one state library, you've seen one uh, one state library, the, the range is really out there. Our uh, commission really focuses on library development and the talking book service. So we don't have a, a physical collection here. We don't have an archives. We really do uh, have the opportunity to focus on uh, how we can build capacity and, and work with library development. I wanted to touch on a few of our newer initiatives. Uh, with an emphasis on the the digital aspects, we have uh, Idaho Digital Ebook Alliance through Overdrive. We got that uh, ramped up uh, at the very beginning of COVID. Uh, really focused on our K through 12 uh, population, but every public library uh, that has an ebook collection and consortiums are now connected to that, and uh, we have over 50 school districts that are connected as well. So we're uh, beefing up those efforts and trying to get more school districts to participate in that program. Uh, we've really uh, grown our telehealth services and the support that we offer from the state level. We have uh, over 30 uh, libraries that are participating in telehealth initiatives, and we have a brand new uh, toolkit that I'll, I'll share on another slide. Uh, similar, Don, to the, the Georgia scenario that you were talking about, we do a reimbursement after E-rate with state funds and have been able to offer that so that 100% uh, of broadband costs are covered uh, through those two programs and uh, have found that to be really beneficial for our, uh, particularly our rural libraries. Uh, recently, we, want, we launched a statewide digital navigator program and um, are working on some train the trainer tools and some other resources so that we can uh, gear that program up uh, when the digital equity funds become available. Uh, another, another program that we've launched just in the last uh, two years is called our Connecting Communities Program, and we provide laptops and training for uh, some of the covered populations in the Digital Equity Act, uh, aging populations, rural populations. Um, if I, I think most people are familiar with those covered populations, but in Idaho, 76% of our population falls into at least one of those covered populations, particularly when you look at uh, rural and aging populations. And then um, we are, are kind of in holding pattern for the digital equity funds that are coming to each state. Uh, we were fortunate to lead those efforts here in Idaho and have, uh, I think, a, a great plan with our partners um, to, to implement and really, I think, help bridge the digital divide. So we're waiting to hear what our state allotment will be, and then we're uh, really gearing up to lead the charge and help everyone in the state with the goals that we've set forth in the plan. And I've got a few slides that outline some of that. Uh, a little more information about our telehealth, and then I'm happy to answer any questions either during or, or after. I know Don gave me a, a generous uh, time, but I, I want to be mindful of everybody else's uh, time this morning. This new telehealth kit that we, um, that was just launched last month, and feel free to kick click on the link or we can share that also in the chat and encourage other states and uh, anybody who's interested in that. That's really been an amazing partnership with a private foundation and now health and welfare to make sure that libraries have the equipment that they might need to set up telehealth spaces in their facilities. And, um, and that's been very popular here. So we're looking forward to making it even bigger and better. We were able to use some of the capital projects funds that, that were available uh, to do a little bit of library construction. Uh, we had about $3 million, um, which doesn't sound like a lot, and it certainly didn't go as far as we would have liked, but it did help 13 facilities with construction, uh, everything from brand new libraries to remodel projects, and uh, we're happy to help facilitate that. 
uh, a few of our goals for the, the broadband access um, plan that we have just developed and we'll, are hoping to implement here. Uh, we hear uh, from NTIA that we may hear as, as soon as March uh, what the allotments will be and are just waiting for final word on the plan to make sure that uh, they don't have any other changes that they'd like to see. But again, I think a really comprehensive plan uh, and an opportunity for, for libraries and our partners in the state to make a big difference. So uh, we have five goals in the plan. The first one is to increase adoption and affordability of broadband technology, uh, the going away of the affordable connectivity program has certainly presented some challenges for everyone across the nation and uh, we'll be working to help uh, internet providers and others ensure that there are options for people uh, who have a hard time paying for their monthly internet costs. Um, one of the one of the goals that we're going to be working on is improving this online accessibility uh, and making sure that at least government websites are uh, equipped to handle mobile devices and be accessible for people with disabilities. Uh, we're looking possibly at putting together a toolkit that can be used and then provide some uh, consulting services for everybody from city and uh, county governments to state government agencies. And if, if anybody out there already has a, a great toolkit and some resources, uh, we, we greatly believe in sharing what we have and, and tapping into other resources. So uh, we would love to hear more about toolkits that people might have available. We'll be focused on increasing digital skills and working with cybersecurity and doing most, most of that through uh, digital navigator programs and ensuring that we have as many in-person uh, help offerings as possible. Um, have already started that a little bit, but really are waiting to hear what the, the allotment will be so that we can gear those programs up uh, and get, get that going. Uh, there's several components in the plan about spreading awareness of cybersecurity and online privacy. In the focus groups that we did uh, with our partners statewide, that was uh, one of the number one concerns that people had and know that we have a lot of work to do to um, ensure that, that people are safe when they're searching online, banking online, doing all those things. So we'll be working with a coalition of people to provide resources and training uh, and get the word out about resources that are out there. Uh, finally, our fifth goal is to increase the availability of devices and the technical, technical support. So when people get stuck, there's people that can help them get unstuck and uh, everything from device pipelines to providing uh, free laptops for people in the covered population. And we're gearing up for that right now, kind of building on the uh, initial pilot program that we did with connecting communities, um, talking to libraries about just giving, giving away those uh, laptops, sort of using a uh, learn to earn model. So if people come to the training, they learn about cybersecurity, they uh, are able to have digital skills training, then the, the laptops and tools are theirs to keep. And uh, that's been, I think, a really uh, fun project to get going. And then finally, uh, I just wanted to open it up for, for questions and uh, provide my contact information and a few of those websites that we've been talking about. And, and Don, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about uh, other challenges or, or things outside of the digital skills area, digital access area, and I'm, I'm happy to share a little bit about that too. Great, well, well please do. Uh, one thing though, I appreciate the excuse me the level of organization Stephanie that you've got very clear goals stated out uh, stated and and that you're backing up on uh, the the rise of telehealth is a really interesting topic uh, I appreciated that banner you you have produced there that I presume sits in in the uh, various libraries to let people know that such a thing is available to them. I wondered if you were collecting any any information yet on how how that's growing or you know feedback from libraries on telehealth. Yeah, there are um, 
There have been fewer hiccups than I anticipated with um, scheduling some of those rooms and, and working with that. I think still some challenges with getting uh, providers on board and ensuring them that this is an option that they can use. Um, but but the adoption, um, particularly among the libraries, I think you talked in some of your, your previous sessions about well, how can we keep asking uh, public library staff to do more and more and more when they're already, you know, sort of up up to here with uh, what they're doing, and that's that's definitely a challenge. But um, they they understand the needs in their communities and have really risen to the occasion on so many of these things and are happy to to offer those. So it's it's going, I think, kind of slowly but surely and getting the word out to, to communities and providers has been one of the biggest challenge. Great. You mentioned partners. Uh, I guess that's that's one of the partners that you're mentioning are the are the uh, health providers. So what are their what are their concerns about the, the libraries being facilities endpoints for people to to connect? I think for some of them, it's just something they don't even think about. And it's so far maybe out of their uh, realm of possibilities. Uh, they might consider a, a rural clinic as a, as a possible telehealth site, but uh, many of them just haven't even considered that uh, a library as a community center uh, offers so much more than books and that they today's libraries can offer, you know, a, a nice, clean, quiet space for, for those sessions uh, that they can serve so many more patients, particularly our mental health um, issues. Sometimes right. people are waiting three to six months for an initial consult. So nice. yeah, that's, that's been uh, interesting just to see the awareness uh, bubble, bubble about. Great. I you know, you make me think that the that this is a classic kind of uh, libraries do that. I didn't know libraries did that kind Absolutely. of circumstance. The list is just as long as your arm. But it also makes me think that rather than kind of one by one, there should be a sort of a global effort to uh, uh, make the health industry aware of this. You know, this maybe this is a job for ALA or or COSLA or any of the library agencies to try to inject this resource and this idea into the, the main flow of conversation for health providers, which themselves need a lot of help. So that that's great. You mentioned the, uh, you mentioned the, uh, I think you were referring to the BEAD grant, the NTIA uh, grant to various states. Uh, so were, were, was your library included in that state plan and did you participate in creating that? Can you give us a little background on how that unfolded? Right. So in Idaho, um, we have an office of broadband, um, and it is located in our Department of Commerce. And when uh, this was first rolled out, it was an office of one staff uh, member. And um, so we sort of divvied up the work, and they are focused on more of the infrastructure side, and we're focused on the digital equity side. And we work very collaboratively. We meet, you know, once a week, uh, Dylan Baker's on the call today, and he has uh, really taken the lead in the 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 statewide plan, working with our partners. Um, we were lucky enough to have a, a local university here, Boise State University, who we contracted with to do the community engagement parts, the focus groups, the statewide telephone survey to gather information that we could use for the plan. So I think um, most state librarians are active in the in the digital equity and bead planning. Uh, I believe that Idaho is the only state that I'm aware of where we were the designated entity to uh, complete all the, the paperwork and the plan and get that in. And uh, going forward, we will be the, the key um, entity for implementation. So wow. uh, yeah, really looking forward to that, That's that impressive. aspect. I had not heard that one before. Well, uh, kudos to you for stepping up to that, to that role. We had one more follow up on uh, telehealth here, and it's it's a kind of a classic one related to uh, the availability of space and some of the concerns I'm sure the health providers are, are uh, you know, privacy 
and maybe security of the line. I don't know, but typically privacy is. So I, I is there phys, are there physical changes that are happening in the libraries to allow these kind of spaces or are they just using a conference room or whatever? Yeah, some of them have used a conference room and that is their designated space, but uh, it is a physical change in in space in those libraries to ensure that there is that confidentiality and privacy. Um, so the funding has been used from Health and Welfare and then our Blue Cross of Idaho Foundation for Health to ensure that there is the, the maximum amount of privacy. And of course, uh, librarians are, are big into patron privacy, so that's one of our tenants. Um, so we just get them set up with the with the screen and then make sure that that's uh, erased when they leave their appointment, their telehealth appointment, and are not involved at all in any of the um, of setting up of, of that. They they don't know what's what's being discussed. And uh, and so far, again, that's, that's working pretty well. And people don't have to drive uh, three hours to six hours to get to their check-in appointment. So um, it's it's been a great partnership. And, and libraries are very appreciative of having those resources. I think people, it's hard for people to appreciate the scale of distances in the West. Uh, but... <laughs> It, they're big, and uh, it, but it, but it kind of connects to the to the equity question. I appreciated the work that you're doing there on equity, and it uh, especially for people with special needs that you know it's expensive to do that, and that that reminds me of you know basic market principles. So the reason that broadband is poorly provided in rural areas is because it's expensive to do that. It's more expensive to do that than it is in urban area. Fewer people, they're farther away. And so the market just left to itself will not do that. It will stop at the point where doing things are, mar are, are maximally profitable. And so it's the principle, it's the public principle, public policy principle that we've had for universal services. So, which means that if a service is deemed essential or basic then everyone should have affordable access to it and that involves extracting funds from more profitable markets and subsidizing less profitable markets so that's the principle in broadband that we you know haven't we did it with electricity and telephone we did have not done it with broadband we're trying to force it now with all this extra carrots and billions of dollars there there's no stick on that side of it as there was with the utilities uh, being provided for, but the, it's the same principle people that have special needs in education or just access to information. And that the library plays an essential role in, in filling out these uh, equity challenges that we just you know embrace as a country. But so this is really a terrific report uh, on Idaho and the great work you're doing and I, I, I think we'll have more questions for you, but we'd like to uh, turn it over to Stephen now and uh, find out what's happening in Ontario, the great province of Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, another point, uh, Stephen, that I know you'll touch on, and Stephanie, I meant to ask you, is sort of the role that state libraries or provincial libraries play in supporting smaller libraries and rural libraries. We just kind of began to touch on it. And one of the mechanisms for equity of supporting libraries is the state library, whereas the large urban uh, systems like Toronto or maybe Boise uh, have, you know, have have resources. They have IT staff and uh, and and they can handle most of the things, and they don't relate to the state library so much as the smaller libraries do. And so this is a really important function that that these state agencies play. Uh, Stephen. Welcome. Welcome back. Thank you so much for, for filling in on this late notice. Uh, many of you may have noticed we made a change in the schedule. We had uh, Michael Scott, the state librarian from Iowa, scheduled, but Michael came down yesterday with the flu and, and apologized and had to, uh, had to step away. And Stephen has very helpfully stepped up as Stephen is often found to do. So Stephen, welcome. Tell us what's happening and going to be happening in Ontario. Thank you, Don. And I really appreciate your inviting me. Uh, 
it was short notice, but I was able to put a few slides together. I apologize if they're not up to my usual try to do standards. I When I do slides now, I want to try mid journey and create something cool because it's just so exciting to learn new things now. Uh, and thank you, IFLA, for hosting these. I've been inspired by them for years, and I really appreciate Don's contribution to our field globally. Sometimes he thinks of this as a U.S. national thing, but no. When you look at the attendees list, it's a bunch of people from all over the world being inspired by state librarians and big thinkers. So I, I love it. I'll just say that there's no such thing as a state librarian in most of Canada. And there's rarely such a thing as a provincial library. Uh, it's cobbled together in different ways of cooperation. And the differences are more than just the way we spell things. Uh, we do like our U's, <laughs> putting extra U's in words. And uh, it took a long time for Microsoft to give us a Canadian spell checker because we choose some British spellings like we and some American spellings. So we use organization with the S, with the Z, not an S, but we use color with the U. So it's hilarious. Uh, we have a shared cultural overlap with the world. Uh, probably more with Europe than America, but America, you know, we're America's hot. We like to joke. And, uh, and we have some pretty big differences. And so this has affected broadband and some of our strategies. So we're, we're a multilingual country, uh, not performative, like optional, you can learn a little Spanish in the States. It's law. It's law that we have to have uh, French and English. It's uh, emerging law that uh, we respect indigenous languages and our court system requires everybody to be dealt with in the language they're most comfortable with. So that changes digitization and what we collect and all that sort of stuff. We have three legal systems. We have common law and code civil, uh, very similar. I, I think your only civil code state is Louisiana because Canadians that, uh, that we're called Acadians and you call them Cajuns, uh, <laughs> Uh, help build. Um, and so, and then we have uh, several territories that are based uh, largely on native law and, and native uh, alternative systems. Uh, we have broader rights to free speech and freedom of expression. We have uh, deeper rights on privacy. So there's a bunch, and, and also uh, it's against the law to have a national identity card. So the US ties its metadata together with your social security number, and it's a reasonably public thing. Uh, that's against the law in Canada. So there's no way to tie together records of people, their health records with their uh, finance records or whatever. So you have to sign, you have to legally sign something for them who have your social insurance number. And that changes how we track people and identity. Uh, we're a social democracy, not a capitalist democracy. Like 19 of the top 20 countries in the world are social democracies and America is the outlier. We're a single payer healthcare system and that changes telehealth and how we do things. And it also has heavy duty uh, privacy rights on it, on how we're allowed to share health information. We have four publicly funded uh, school systems, French, Catholic and Protestant, Catholic and public, and English Catholic and public. Uh, they're all fully funded for through through uh, junior kindergarten through grade 12. And we have all day junior kindergarten and all day senior kindergarten uh, as part of our strategy for daycare and for empowering uh, children at an early age. So everybody has to, so the rule is everybody has to be reading by grade one, uh, which is a good librarian thing. <laughs> uh, we're a constitutional monarchy and 
one of the consequences of that in the library context is the king owns all public documents. And so we end up having to pay for public documents, whereas your constitution lets all national public documents be in the public domain. That changes how we get statistics and how we deal with open data and open access. And so there's some big differences. And since I work in both countries regularly, I'm fully aware of that. I've been in 49 of the 50 states. So if anybody's on here in West Virginia and wants a speaker, <laughs> I really want to check that box. Uh, it's part of my uh, collection of how I get to things. So I'm going to talk about today uh, broadband initiatives in Ontario, uh, return on investment, economic, social, and digital in libraries, and how we've tied it to broadband initiatives. Uh, shared chief information security officer work we've been doing for the last uh, 10 years, uh, the cloud and how the pandemic uh, moved all that stuff forward and in particular how it affects our First Nations and small rural northern and remote libraries. I'm also going to talk a little bit about MOUs and cooperations between library systems since uh, we have a lot of urban centers a lot of, uh, like Toronto was sounded by the GTA, the uh, Greater Toronto Area is uh, the fourth largest uh, city in North America. It's the financial capital. It's, uh, we're a knowledge economy. 4% of our uh, GDP comes from manufacturing. And since we're the largest oil provider in the world, you know, when you see an ad on American television saying uh, we have more than enough oil in America to support our needs, that's only because they're using the definition of America being North America, not the USA, because you don't. <laughs> you, you Under the free trade agreement, <laughs> you have access to our oil. In fact, the free trade agreement says we have to leave ourselves short if the U.S. falls short. So when you have a crisis, we ship more oil. Our economies are deeply tied together. So we're a resource-driven economy, but the majority of our workers are knowledge workers. And I emphasize that in my lobbying activities all the time, because knowledge work for a place like Canada, which with the exception of the Scandinavian countries, is the... Uh, most highly educated country in the world and has double the number of post high school graduates uh, than the US. So we're a knowledge economy. We need broadband infrastructure in order to grow. And we need it to be respectful of small rural northern and remote communities and First Nations. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how the, since this series started with the pandemic, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we learned from the pandemic using the cloud. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about infrastructure and integrated library systems and where we need to move. And uh, and then, of course, as uh, Don said, let's talk about small, rural, northern and remote libraries. You'll notice that I've changed the language to Canadian language. You tend to use small and rural libraries. And uh, that's... Uh, continental version of how the U.S. is, whereas when I've been in Alaska up in Barrow on the Arctic Ocean, that's a remote place, and it's incredibly technological and great. Uh, we have a lot of land that is remote. It's based on satellite connectivity, not on wired, and uh, we have two satellites that service the entire north called Anik 1 and Anik 2. And we had a crisis once when they both broke on the same week. And of course, you probably know, Don, that uh, most of your major cell phone systems are facing disruptions today. I'm hoping it's not a cyber attack, but uh, Verizon and T-Mobile and all of them are up and down and have been all morning. So that may have uh, limited who can sign in today. Uh, when we look at libraries, you can look at this slide yourselves, but 
Uh, we spend a lot of time working on new Canadians. We're very pro-immigration up here. Uh, one of our largest immigrant groups is Americans. Thank you, Mr. Trump. Uh, <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> However, uh, we uh, get a lot of new Canadians. As you know, the birth rate for our millennials and zillennials is way too low to support ourselves. Last week, uh, boomers became the second largest population. Uh, millennials are now the largest population and Gen Z is quickly catching up with them. Uh, so we're looking at a, a much more youthful framework that we haven't seen since the 60s and a significant difference in how digital uh, presence is empowering our employment workforce, knowing that the millennials are the majority of our workforce now. 99% uh, of Ontarians live in a community with a free public library. Uh, we've been, they've been around for a long time. We benefited from the uh, Carnegie grants. 60% uh, of the population report holding a library card. And uh, we have a lot of books and a lot of digital. So in Ontario, we have 100,000 ebooks for every library. And every library gets, uh, through my lobbying, all the software to support anybody who has a reading challenge or a learning challenge. So any uh, where boys in particular and some girls have a problem when we move from grade three to grade four and go from large print to uh, chapter books, boys' visual acuity doesn't develop as quickly as girls. So they have a reading lag. So every boy who experiences that can get any ebook they want uh, bumped up to a larger font with larger letting and bridge the divide until their visual acuity uh, increases. And that's licensed for the whole country, but in particular in Ontario for every library. So everybody loves their libraries. We get, uh, this is a little older, it's two years old, but we get 137, 137 minutes, min, visits per minute. Museums get 32% of people in Ontario using them. Public and commercial art galleries get 33%. Uh, performing arts get 55%. And public libraries get 73% usage. About a third of our usage is people who don't have library cards. And that's a challenge we've been working through. Uh, all, if you calculate all the people who in all of North America who an, an, attend an NHL, NBA, or NFL game, uh, public libraries in Ontario get more attendance. Uh, we get about 1.4 million visits per week. And the next time someone says libraries are no longer relevant, consider these stats for a minute. Uh, in that minute, 137 people will visit the public library physically. It's actually 296 visits per minute when you, and it's actually higher now. This is a little older data, uh, but we get two visits every second. If you take all the physical visits a day, we can lay those people end to end and stretch all the way from Ottawa to Toronto. Now you <laughs> mentioned uh, that, like, you know, you got to understand how big Ontario is. It's, it's up to three times bigger than uh, Texas, it, I think Alaska might be a little bigger than us, but uh, it is huge. If you get on a train in Toronto and go north to see the polar bears or the killer whales, uh, it'll take you 24 hours. So we're huge and that creates broadband challenges when you go up to a community that might only have 26 people in it especially if it's a First Nations Reserve. So what we did uh, under my leadership when I was president of the Ontario Library Association and prior to that when I was helping uh, right the ship of uh, OLA so that we were profitable or had a surplus is library language, uh, we set up two conferences, Libraries 2020 and Libraries 2025. We paid for one board member and one librarian to come to the Roy York Hotel 
from all 300 plus library systems in Ontario. And we spent three days brainstorming first and teaching people things and then choosing the top four or five priorities for us to collaborate on for the entire province. And then we met again in 20, for the 2025 vision to keep two of them and, and because we'd accomplished two of them and uh and move forward so we have a we had a full province prioritization based on shared priorities and of course three of the top priorities had a digital component we merged all library librarian library worker library technician library clerk training into a single learning management system for the entire province we got the government to give us through a grant, $18 million to accomplish that. So now we have an e-learning system for everybody in the province and we harvest and store all the courses for use later. So you can uh, do asynchronous training of your staff. Um, it seems to uh, do a number of other initiatives and uh, I, I won't get into it right now. Uh, we did uh, recent funding for broadband where we acquired $12 million for rural northern and uh, for last mile work in rural northern and First Nations libraries. Uh, I wrote a grant and got $10 million for research, and I'll show you the results of that grant where we where we got a grant to, and I'm so glad that Kim Silk is on this call. It, Kim Silk inspired me as one of the great statisticians in Ontario, uh, where she was integral to building one of the first ROI models for Toronto Public Library, and she's consulted to extend it onto other library systems. And then I got the grant uh, to build up someone on Kim's work, but also to separate economic impact from social impact from digital impact so that we could uh, answer the questions we were getting in our lobbying efforts. Uh, my work was to expand it beyond the Ministry of Culture. I know in the States, it's often the Ministry of Education that uh, does a lot of your funding uh, and goes through the State Library. In our case, it can come from any one of 18 different ministries. So I expanded our lobbying to work with the cabinet ministers and more importantly, uh, the senior staff, uh, the deputy ministers and the associate deputy ministers in every cabinet office so that we had sustainable funding envelopes. And it takes about three years to get some of this funding and we were successful at it. But we Steven? looked at the broad, yes? Uh, two minutes, please. Okay. So we got the Public Library Act changed to make it so that everybody had to offer broadband for free and couldn't charge for it. And then we focused on MOUs between large libraries, partnerships, alliances. So we have various initiatives where we can do uh, peer analyses. Uh, we have the Valuing Ontario Libraries Toolkit and the Bridge Project. So I lobbied to get all the public library data made open data. And then we have key talent, including uh, Bob Molyneux and Kim Silk in the province who are experts at statistics. And, and I'll, I'll say a little bit myself. And then we do annual reports on uh, First Nations. So the Valuing Ontario Libraries Toolkit shows that you, you all know the $6 per dollar uh, invested in a library metric that's quite common and good. Uh, we found the social return on investment was around $27. So that number has been very good for us. And then Toronto Public Library, through a grant that I organized for them, uh, built the digital impact models. And I highly recommend you go look at some of those where it shows the huge impact we have on employment, ec economy, learning, success, new Canadians. Uh, then I'm on the board of uh, Orion, which is the last mile not-for-profit. I don't like the phrase not-for-profit. I use community benefit corporation. Uh, I don't think you should define yourself by what you're not. 
uh, they've managed to put uh, wiring. When we repaved Young Street, the longest street in the world, we repaved it by putting black fiber underneath the street as they were paving. So now we have a thousand plus mile long backbone to get us into the north where all of our remote rural and com communities are. And then we've connected every hospital, every municipality, and every uh, First Nations reserve in process and uh, the libraries as a coordinated response. So we get our research institutions there. Then we created a shared chief information security officer position and tools collaboratively to deal with the things you've seen where they attack sick kids, they attack the British Library and Toronto Public Library is still recovering. Uh, those are th those cyber attacks are things. So we looked at uh, ensuring that the Canadian stuff was end to end encrypted on every point. And there's only one integrated library system that does that, Circe Dynix, and all the others are endpoint to endpoint encryption, where it's only on the end. So I can walk into any library that doesn't use Circe Dynix and look at everything on their network. That's, Please read, uh, David. Here it is. So we have a uh, joint automation server initiative that empowers through web-based stuff all of our uh, rural remote libraries so they don't have to run servers, but they've got scalable, tight, good servers. And then the, the pandemic response was we could stop fines instantly. We could uh, increase digital presence. We could remove fees. We could uh, build off-site, manage clerical work. And then I'll skip over the First Nations stuff, but we, we can talk about that in the questions. And then uh, just the last thing is to remember that a lot of our people are on fly-in communities. They may only have access to trucks when the ice roads are here. Global warming, as Don always brings up, is a real challenge when so many of our communities only have ice roads. We have orange helicopters that fly in for medical and bring in doctors for them once a month or every weekend. I have a bunch of friends who are doctors who do that, but they may not have a cell tower. They may not have a school. They, in general, Indian uh, native reserves, status Indian native reserves, only have K to eight schools. Sometimes they go to grade 10, but mostly they have to leave the reserve or go on online learning to do that. Uh, we have to deal with clean water first, but we need to do it parallel to broadband for social and economic impact. All right, great, wonderful, Stephen. So, so much information. You're you're a veritable tsunami of information. <laughs> and, uh, That's what I was doing. And and it's like uh, tsunamis. It's it's hard to stop. You have. You always have more to add to very interesting information. Um, so uh, you can stop the share there and we'll bring uh, Stephanie back. And I, I think this point about uh, about uh, rural libraries is especially relevant. Stephen made the point of the size and, and thank you, Kim, for for answering David's question about uh, literacy uh, challenges. Uh, but the, the, the point, the role of the provincial, well, certainly the state libraries and supporting rural libraries, smaller rural libraries that lack the resources is one of the key, one of the key functions. And one of the main challenges that we have as countries is the the so-called divides, the economic divides, the digital divides, the manifestation of a, an economic divide, social divides, they're creating political divides, which make governance really challenging. And so this is an added role that the state libraries play. And, and so I'm wondering how, uh, Stephanie, you see the sort of the ongoing challenge of, of supporting these small libraries that may have a staff of one or a couple of few, just a few people, uh, how do you see that evolving uh, over time? The, the cities are just running away with all the latest new stuff, as they will. So do you have a special plan for 
keeping the rural libraries kind of caught up? I, well, I do think this five-year plan uh, will will affect uh, what we call the the community anchor institutions, including libraries, and uh, allow them to make the needed upgrades. Um, I think they've done a, a decent job for the most part, but um, and I'm I'm very envious, Stephen, of your your plan to provide server space. And I know Washington State has got a statewide a network that they've been working on and kind of providing some of that. Uh, backbone support. Uh, we do a lot of consulting and we are on, you know, the phone and uh, visiting as many of our rural libraries as possible and provide, you know, that backup support when they don't have uh, somebody in their community that can do some IT help and uh, work through the challenges that they have. So I think the next five years are, are going to be crucial for, um, catching folks up and really working on a, a longer term strategic uh, initiatives and how we can sustain that. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled that, again, we're going to be able to help kind of take the lead in some of those areas and that there's going to be real funding that will help address this. We haven't had um, hardly any state funding that's been made available to address some of the needs. Uh, we, we definitely provide statewide services, databases, uh, the eBooks and, and some other things, but I do feel like we're a little bit uh, behind the curve on, on where we could and should be, uh, particularly when I hear about Stephen's initiatives and all that's going on there. So uh, we're working on it and in the next five years with this, with this statewide plan, I think is gonna move us ahead uh, a lot. Great, great. Do you feel the, I mean, the libraries are primarily supported locally, right? I mean, this is a just a rule, I would say, in the U.S. is that uh, the vast majority of funds for libraries are local. There's an advantage and a disadvantage to that. Of course, the advantage is that it allows the library to do whatever its community wants it to do. It's free of the kind of narrow charters that schools have, the clinics have, all the other institutions really are very, have tightly prescribed services. The, the libraries really are just free to to be anything their communities need and want them to be and are paying for them to do. So it's uh, it's a special kind of circumstance, but then the flip side is how do people appreciate so such diverse services when everybody has their own pet thing? And how do you see the, the kind of the local uh, situation in supporting libraries? Do you see that kind of holding steady, declining or rising? Or do you have an impression on that? Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> it's a good question and the timing is uh, really relevant because um, most people I think are aware of the challenges that uh, conservative states, which which Idaho is one of, um, are facing right now with book challenges and backlash. So we have, um, I think, some definite a uh, swell of support in some communities, but it's not consistent across the state. Um, so it's a real uh, challenging time to be a library staff person anywhere in the state because of um, this backlash and movement. Um, it's a it's a small group of people, but they're very vocal. And you know, today later in our in our legislative session, uh, we'll be dealing with a bill. We've it's been on the docket for three years. It's toned down, but it's still you know not great. And um, so we have that that we're facing while we're trying to do you know amazing things on our on behalf of our communities and getting the word out about that and, and not letting that take over um all the good things that libraries are working on so definitely it's that's a tricky question and the timing is is out there just because it, it is such a challenging time it is indeed and you you uh, make a a really uh important point so much of library activity being community-based is supported by efforts of the community, the volunteer efforts to make the library a really a community center. And these kinds of activities are really easy to disrupt. You know, anybody that's ever been into a, you know, an all volunteer meeting, if one person wants to make a scene, it, you know, it's just it. And it's very, very difficult. You don't have kind of enforcement techniques that you do in, in formal settings and corporate settings. And so a uh, few people can 
upset the apple cart pretty pretty easily. So are you seeing a backlash to the backlash or people <laughs> in communities saying, are they, you know, picketing for their library? Or are they coming out in response that we hope? Yes, uh, we do have, I think for the first time, and again, I've mentioned that 32 years um, in the state uh, working on these issues, and this has is, been the, the craziest time <laughs> that we've ever seen, but uh, several library alliances have formed, and we had uh, over 400 people show up at the state house. Uh, both for a read-in and then 400 people signed up to testify against the current uh, library bill. And I've never seen anything like that before. It took a while for people to, um, to get organized and to clue in that this is super serious. Um, a bill last year, our governor vetoed, um, and then it, that veto was almost over overridden. So I think that's what it took for people to uh, really galvanize and, and come out in support of libraries. And we have had, uh, again, a little bit of mixed bag on even library trustee elections and uh, who's running for those, who's going to get elected. And But people have to pay attention to those issues now and get on board and and fight to protect uh, their rights. Absolutely. Um, I mean, library activism is not uh, a running activity. It, 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 it requires a challenge before people say, oh, yeah, that I really care about that. I need to do something about that. You remind me of uh, Arab Spring, as a matter of fact, when uh, all the Egyptians were revolting against the, the government and they saw the Library of Alexandria as an emblem of the government because uh, it was Barack's wife that had been the, the key instigator of the, the, the last rebuilding of that amazing edifice. And so it suddenly looked like a target for, for people. And the people of Alexandria went out and, and held hands around that entire facility, massive facility, you know, a chain of people standing and saying, no, not here, not again, not this library. And it just, uh, it just gives me chills thinking about people taking actions like what you described at the state house. And, and I, I hope we can see more of that because people need to wake up to uh, the importance of these, like the critical, essential nature and value of libraries in, in the community and social structure. So Wonderful. Great. Keep that up. We'll all be pitching in and, and doing what we can. Steven will be doing that. I know he does that every day, uh, making the point for libraries and backing it up with evidence. And Steven, you've you've pre-answered all the questions, so I'm, I'm not going to come back to you because we've, <laughs> we've run out of our time here. And so I, I'm going to I'm going to close out the recording here with a, a, a special thank you to Stephanie for your great work and your your diligence and Stephen for stepping in here at the last minute to give us a really a really good session today. I think we're I think we did a, had a, a we have a good one. We'll we'll try to get the recording uh, uh, up tomorrow and uh, we'll be back next week with another uh, interesting presentation on. Uh, the use of uh, remote hotspots. So, so many people depend on libraries for access, as was illustrated today, <clears throat> access to the internet and access to public digital information. But they have to go to one of the facilities, you know, just may not be that close. Uh, and so we've seen, and we as Gigabit Libraries have worked on this to find ways to extend access to library Wi-Fi as a way to put it. And uh, the using uh, various technologies to spread and extend that, that service beyond the walls has been, uh, well, it's been a, uh, a challenge, but we're gonna hear more about that next week from the New York Public Library. We're gonna have the Orange County Library and we're gonna have the Malvern County Arkansas Library. So we're going to have a real variety of approaches to uh, this, uh, this situation. So with that, I am going to look for the stop recording button.